Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, I would, we'll just get everything. I was here last year and uh, supposed to be here on this particular day, but I don't know if you remember last year that we had a little bit of snow, so I was greeted with that. Then I, so I was watching the, the weather forecast as I came in, you know, very closely, and they had all these snow squalls and snow for yesterday and today and tomorrow. I even booked extra hotel space, but uh, things are going a little better. But I want to thank you, especially for, you know, you've been really kind to me. But this morning when I came out of the hotel, I stayed at the um, Best Western, just uh, to the west there. And uh, as I came out, it was 8.45 in this morning. You know, the snow was covering everything, the car out to the east, the sun was rising. And I, how you arranged it, I don't know. But here coming down the road, Highway 16, was this beautiful Jaylor mixer being pulled by a tractor, just <laughs> gliding by. It just, just made me feel great. I don't, yeah, yeah, I was, I was wondering, by any chance, whoever that was, are you here this morning? <laughs> or you may know who it is. Anyhow, it's great to be here um, for this uh, topic, which was the same for last year. You know, it's, you want to keep things fresh, but, you know, cows and TMRs, they have this way of changing so much every year. So we'll try and, uh, you know, that was a, a, a bit of a joke, you know. Um, <laughs> the, the, the things don't, you know, change that fast in the TMR business, but uh, there are, are things. It's interesting, the more things, what do they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And uh, we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, this morning. Um, ro the role of the TMR mixer, other than just helping us with mechanical duties and decreasing the, f the physical activity, the main things we're trying to do is really quite simple. These combine disparate or different ingredients into a homogenous mix. You know, but once we've done that, the thing we tend to forget is that we're trying to create a mix that resists separation by the cattle during eating. If we achieve the first goal, and it looks great in the mixer, but don't achieve the second goal, we haven't done anything. We haven't done anything positive. I've been in the business uh, uh, scan, or, um, sc scanning, uh, spanning uh, the time from uh, full hand feeding in, in stanchions, to, uh, and I say from hand feeding to what we're going to is self-feeding. Under the stanchion system, under computerized feeding in the parlor, computerized feeding in the free stalls, we were really doing a system of individual animal portioning grain. When we moved to the TMR system uh, under, uh, and it, it really doesn't even matter if we're feeding TMR in a stanchion system, uh, we're really in a self-feeding system, and the whole basis of this is is that what they are delivered is that the animals cannot separate that out. In this scenario, we gave so much grain per day based on the milk production or from a computer, and they really didn't eat, get any more. They ate it fast, we were, uh, but what they varied was their forage intake. What we ran into problems with is as milk produ production started to increase uh, past about 50 pounds of milk, we, we ran past the sort of the 8 to 10 pounds per meal level that the animal could eat in grain and not get actual uh, bouts of almost acute acidosis per meal, short bouts of it. And that we knew we had to feed smaller amounts uh, you know, in multiple meals. This led to the computer-based feedings as we bred animals for 50, 60, 70, 80 pounds of milk. Um, but then, you know, we, we didn't want to be in the barn that much, so we brought in the computer feeders. So we could feed grain six times uh, a day. But we still ran into problems because what we basically didn't understand, or we finally understood, is that the animals... Um, it was elective for them as to if they ate the forage. So they would continue to eat the grain, 
but then be variable on whether they the forage. And when we put them through hoof trimming, they went through uh, breeding, uh, estrus, et cetera. Um, they went through intake changes, but didn't necessarily change their grain intake, but they changed their forage intake. This is why the number one thing we battled at that time was low milk production, SARA, reproductive problems, low milk production. Now, is some of that starting to sound familiar as to what the classic issues are today? They have not changed. And one of the main reasons is in that we forgot that in the TMR business, it isn't just that we throw things in to that mix. For it to work, the animals cannot be able to separate it out. Because if we have a TMR, and we're going to talk a bit about the basics, the physics and things that are involved with it, where the animal can dig holes and cause the grain to separate out, we actually get into a situation it's not that the animals have to eat the forage so they chew enough to balance the grain. This has been the dogma or the story over the last 10, 15 years. It is wrong because we have animals getting adequate forage. And this is why you feed straw, you feed more long hay, etc. And the problem not only doesn't go away, it tends to get worse in many cases. Because you focus on making an animal chew more, but what is happening is they still have free access to the grain. And in this situation, they have a cafeteria. They have tons of grain. And dominant cows that have time can go from place to place to place. Here they were restricted to what they were fed in terms of grain in front of them and not eat the forage. But when we go to the TMR situation, what they can feed in grain if they are a dominant cow and are aggressive, they have an unlimited amount of grain that they can eat. And this is the basis of our challenges where we have butterfat uh, and production issues as well in the same herd. And the other point I try and make in terms of, I, I should make, here we talked about running into these problems, you know, starting at uh, 25 kilos milk production. Uh, and as we went further, you know, to 30, 40. If we're talking 30, 40 kilo milk production, to achieve that with different uh, levels of milk production, as you know today, as we go forward, we have cows that, have to, that are peaking at 100 kilos of milk, okay, at target. And all of you are using the same genetics. All of your cows have the same capability for over 40 kilo milk production. So they have the same nutritional uh, effects or defects if you don't feed them the energy that they require. A 100 kilo cow at peak milk production, not only does she have the intake level, she will be needing to consume, I've got to do a little math in my head, on the order of 25 kilos if I think, of grain. That's massive amounts, and if it's not in balance, and if she can't get it, then we have all of these fallout problems. So, and it is the peak cow that is the important one to focus in on. I guess since they gave me this fancy thing, I should try and use it. Um, in the U.S., I did some work with you know common effects, and you can do a little of your thoughts. I know most of you here, because you are here, don't have any of these problems. So this is for you to tell your neighbors who can't quite get it right, okay? But in terms of non-uniformity of mixes and in terms of animals sorting, the common effects is if you analyze what you're doing, let's say relative to the herd average, if you know the average for the industry, um, a sign of non-uniformity in sorting is that you got 0.3 percentage unit drop in milk fat. So if the industry average is running around four, let's say four two, or let's say, you know, let's pick four two is where, and all of you have the same potential basically for milk fat. We have not, uh, the business of breeding against milk fat is individual animal basis, yes, but not on a herd basis. So if you're at three nine, you've got, you've got some issues going on, uh, no doubt. Um, but at, at 0.3 percentage drop in milk production, you are going to be, 
experience a 10% reduction in intake of milk production because of this effects. And these are all subacute. You won't see any health issues or any other problems. You'll just, it'll just be this slight depression, and you might even have great reproduction. It might be very poor because of body weight loss. You'll have excessive body weight loss in, in early lactation because it's actually the cows who don't need the nutrition that are doing most of the sorting, and I'll show you that, taking the grain or the, away from the ones that do need it in peak lactation. When you put this together with an average, this is based on work I did with average U.S. milk component pricing in the 2000s, you know, in, in before the big run-up in price, but using uh, around $16, $17 a hundredweight U.S. pricing. Okay, we have to translate. Canada's a little different in terms of how we do this, but it would have higher value. A 250 cow lactating dairy cow, this cost of decreased milk fat alone in the States has a loss of about $27,000 per year. The interesting thing was is that the next cost of the loss of milk production that went along with it, okay, because it's fat and protein in that milk production, was 64,000. So focusing just on percent fat in terms of lost and, and recovery is actually, and there's new research out that's looking at the components within the fat itself, the short chain fatty acids, you may have heard about this, there was a talk uh, at this at the uh, OMAFRA nutrition conference, we're looking at uh, the lengths of the fatty acids, what they call the de novo group, the mixed group, and the long chain fatty acids in the milk. And it's becoming clearer and clearer that you can't feed more forage to make higher percentage butter fat without losing a whole pile of butter fat in terms of total milk production. It, and I can talk to you individually if you want to get into this. But the reality is, is that when you have sorting and other issues in your TMR, your loss is about three times the loss in milk production than it is in butter fat. But that total was about $91,000 per year, or essentially for a 250-cow lactating dairy cow ration, cost of a new mixer every year. So, so th th we're talking big numbers here in terms of if that ration isn't holding together uh, well. And, of course, the animal performance, your own animal numbers, uh, are, are what really tells you what's going on. Now, overall, in a mix, the goals that we're trying to achieve is all ingredients in a mix. You do anything in terms of feeding supplements separate, grains separate. This is a whole area of discussion in robotic milking that I've written on in the Progressive Dairyman, uh, but in term, that allows separation of grain from forage, and especially in higher producing cows, you're going to go the wrong way because of the ability of animals to choose. The more you narrow that, the better off you will be. But again, only if everything holds together. And what is required is a relatively uniform particle size distribution, a uh, few large particles, and here we talk about greater than about an uh, inch and a half in length, moisture to hold it together and prevent separation. We'll talk about any ration that's predominantly dry, dry hay and, and grains and that is going to separate. There's nothing you can do about it. Surface moisture is the only thing that holds a, t a TMR together. And the number one thing I see in the field is about 90% of rations I see in the field, especially in the United States and even in Canada, unless they have baleage, are too dry and are sorting and basically need water addition to them. And, and you'll see fair amounts of it uh, to actually correct that problem. And then freshly made, of course. Um, so it doesn't dry out as well as have other problems. Um, but non-uniformity and mix is not, equal distribution is not just within that mix itself. You can also have uh, uh, non-uniformity or, or unequal opportunity um, uh, in the feed bump because non-uniformity equals unequal opportunity in terms of the animals that are eating. Anytime you have relatively full bunk and unequal distribution, we normally talk about this part of the ration, for example, may have more grain in it 
at the beginning of or, or at the end of the uh, uh, loadout <coughs> versus towards the uh, the end. You can have that type of distribution, or you just don't have enough feed for the animals. It's all unequal opportunity. Which animals are going to end up down here? Heifers. What would be another name for heifers? Eh? Subordinate animals. Less dominant animals. Which animals are going to end up in here? The bossy dominant. How about in terms of milk production? Hey? Do you think the high producers are going to end up in here? Hey? Not always. Where do the high producers really want to be? Do they? They're everywhere. <laughs> Um, I, I get in trouble with this, but I, I'm going to ask the ladies, because this is more appropriate. Um, when you had children and they were a couple months old, where did you want to be? Nice and quiet. <laughs> My wife wanted to be in bed with me taking care of the child. Um, high producing cows tend to be, be a little ill. Infl there's an inflammatory effect. They want to lie down. They'll eat to meet their requirements. They, at the feed bunk, they're not necessarily dominant. They become dominant once their their requirements and the, the effects of milk production or, pee, or, or of calving and and uh, you know one, once they get over all that and they're coming into peak milk production uh, and uh, how would you say or later they're in full production, then they can uh, exert their dominance. But you have also subordinate peak production, high producing cows, as well as dominant ones. So you have an equal distribution. And based on where the feed is, that's where the cattle will be, you know, and, and, and based on their dominance. Well, I would, things don't always go the way you plan here. Um, now, this might be another case. So this, some of you may have seen this, some may have not. This is just a demonstration of some research at the University of the Behavior Unit at the University of British Columbia, where there's a special uh, research facility where there's seven feeders. And what they did, this is to show the effect of dominance and displacement, it's called. They put uh, two different rations. They had a, essentially a low-grain ration and a high-grain ration. And so for seven days, they fed everything the low-grain ration. Then they switched and fed all of those bunks, the seven bunks, the high-grain ration. And, of course, they all had access to it. The, uh, the stalls are back here. They have to come through here um, to eat the ration. They fed so much, essentially, they fed them a restricted amount of feed. And then what they did, for a period of time, they fed six of the bunks, the low-grain ration, and then they would randomly feed one of those bunks the high-grain ration and watched what the cattle will do and compared the number of interactions and displacements and which cows did the displacement um, <coughs> over time. And this is just one, one example, you know, uh, during the day. Uh, and it's quite obvious what's, what's going on. We've got four animals eating. And this is standard behavior is that it only took them seven days. Well, it took them less than seven days to figure out, okay, uh, where it took, it took 24 hours, you know, or the next feeding for the animals to know which bunk. Every day they changed it. The dominant animals knew exactly where the high grain ration was. And the dominant animals would, um, depending on which animal was in the one with the grain, the, the, obviously the two on the left are subordinate, and the one on the right had just come in, and it was dominant in displacement. So the thing to remember out of all this is cattle do not go to the exact same place to feed. They have a preference area to feed, but they will move in a feed bunk to the area that they prefer based on the feed. And what 
you may not realize is that if you have errors in your mixer, things like gradient densities where you have higher grain content coming, uh, vertical mixers, for example, can have high grain, it's denser at the bottom, coming out first, then more forage at the end. They will figure out where the best feed is for them, which is usually the higher grain or higher quality forages, and they will dominate there in the time when they feel they can be dominant. Now, sorting behavior, you may think it only affects that animal, you know, if it gets too much grain, it gets, gets sick. But these are the characteristics that have been worked out for sorting behavior. And some of you are familiar with Terry DeVries' work and others' work. Uh, I've worked extensively in this area, but you'll find that we all agree it affects both sorters and non-sorters. And sorting is a behavioral thing that animals learn to sort. They do it throughout their lifetime, but when they sort, changes. It's basically when they have time uh, and freedom to exercise it. Uh, but it increases the intake of the rapidly fermented ingredients, grain, whatever they like, fine forages. It, 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 it increases the intake of those items we want uh, that have the greatest nutrition for the whole herd. And in those animals that sort and get a greater proportion, this is where we get our low milk fat, but, uh, and, but we will get increased milk protein, but it also the risk in those animals uh, of Sarah, feet problems, displaced abomens, abomasums, and fat cow. And here we're not talking about the whole herd. You may have the whole herd fine on an average, but it's a one proportion is, is sorting. It's the other side. If these are sorting and getting a greater proportion of grain supplements and good quality forage, the other side gets decreased energy count of the remaining diet. And what I'll show you is generally the sorting activity tends towards the late lactation cows. They are the ones that have the time to stand at the feed bunk. And if they're dominant, they work away at the feed and get their greater share. This is when it gets expressed. And what happens is your peak cows, the high milk production cows that require it, they end up becoming deficient because the other half of the herd is doing the sorting. And the worse it gets, in terms of sorting, the worse it gets for your early lactation cows in terms of what's left for them. So what we get when we're analyzing the herd, an increased incidence of thin cows and excessive body weight loss in early lactation and decreased peak milk production because we've programmed for the rations to be even, but if we're getting excessive fat cows here, we have to be getting excessive body weight loss going into the milk of our peak cows. And if it, when it gets excessive, we actually end up with excessively thin cows. We end up with excessively thin cows. We get prolonged body weight loss. We end up with reproduction problems. So when we have sorting, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that affects the whole herd and is especially detrimental at the beginning. This is why the intake effect and the milk production effect is so much larger than just the milk fat effect. But the milk fat is what we tend to notice uh, first. Now, just to, to show you some actual data, this is data I collected um, developing this, this information out of Alberta. You can see this goes back to actually 2006, once you got the data. But, if, you know, why make a new slide if, it, <laughs> as I say, things just keep being the same. But you'll notice this cow, this cow here, 295 days in milk. Butter fat is 2.9%, protein is 3.0. Okay, you can go if you do. My greatest concern now is that we have on-farm uh, recording People have stopped using milk component recording, figuring, well, they have what they need to measure uh, production and genetics, but we're not getting the milk components, which is a tremendous diagnostic tool in terms of what's happening in the, in the herd. So those that have them, you know, I, I encourage getting at least once a year when there's trouble, we'll get a snapshot 
uh, milk component of the herd, and we can do this type of analysis. Another animal, 230 days, 2.9, 3.2. Contrast that against this Diane here, who's 287 days in milk, 4.1, 3.3. In Alberta, at this time, the average uh, butter fat was around 3.8, okay? And if you look at butter fat curves in terms of production, usually in milk, it's very high in, in, in post-calving because of the, all the butter fat that, um, uh, all the body weight that's being uh, put into milk. Then it reaches a nadir, a bottom, uh, at, at around uh, peak milk production, and then slowly starts coming up again. So does protein. Butter fat tends to come up a little higher. So in terms of these ratios and that, your, your butter fat level uh, that we get should pretty much be, other than these very high ones with animals that are losing a lot of body weight, should be its highest in a given animal in late lactation. But you can pick out these animals, uh, and it's really the proportion of I I in different times and with given animals. These are obviously, and of course it gets confirmed, these are sorters. These are not genetic differences. There are some, but if you, if you felt this was a genetic difference, you'd get rid of that animal in your herd, or most would, even if they were high milk producers. And you'll notice, you know, for late lactation, this this is thirty. This animal is doing thirty-five kilos. This one was doing thirty kilos. This was a forty-five kilo herd that I worked with. Okay, so and and there's new data out to show that there is no relationship. There's no real relationship in terms of herd average milk production and butter fat level. Okay, because we're figuring out that it all a lot of it it has to do with nutrition and energy intake. Okay. Even the idea of starch and the effect of starch is changing with this understanding of milk fat components, uh, of the fatty acids and which component is important. But for now, that's the talk for another day. So what we can do is we graph the whole herd of the fat to protein ratios and we get a curve that looks like this. Now, under ideal situations, this herd was experiencing, it wasn't bad, but a little bit of butter fat depression. It was still high relative to an average herd. So this is milk fat percent minus protein. And you see these high ones here, this is lack of energy intake. You know, when you get up above two, okay, these animals are just moving, uh, translocating huge amounts of uh, body fat to, into, their, into their milk because they just aren't eating enough. They're losing body weight at a tremendous rate. Um, more normal is in here, but you'll notice this sort of has this downward trend when it should have a slight upward trend. And the ones, really anything that's at about uh, below 0 0.1, 0 0.2 in terms of a ratio, these animals all here and below this line you got butter fat below protein. This is, and you'll notice the largest proportion are after 200 days in milk. This is all sorting activity. Um, and we put, I diagram this in two different ways. Um, animals where the inversion is 0.1, butter fat's 0.1 less than fat, uh, protein, or the severe ones, uh, it's Butter fat was 0.5 units uh, lower than protein in those animals. And you can see that the average, I find that in most herds, 15 to 20 percent, doesn't matter what you do, you're going to get 15 to 20 percent of animals in this area. There's just, that's just the way life is on a TMR herd. Uh, for one reason or another at this point, I haven't had time or the money to do the research to see if you can get how far we can get this down in terms of what's normal. But you can see in this herd when we have milk fat problems, what we get is we get this increase as, with incidence of inversions that increases as we go into later lactation. Again, because these animals have, the lower the milk production, the more free time they have to uh, 
uh, engage in sorting activity, and even the less dominant cows are free to do it because there's less pressure during the day at certain times at the feed rail. So um, this is what uh, we look for. Now, why is this? Why is it pro pro prevalent? And for me, I, I think it is what, what we see uh, that has become the norm in eating behavior, uh, we, we've accepted as normal, but it is not. And so this, this is a, a video here of cows on a herd that's plus 40 liter average, 40 kilo average, of 4.3% butter fat of good, good eating behavior and what we really target uh, of a TMR that holds together and what we should be able to see and will see when we eliminate sorting. Um, and what I'll point out here, the, there's animals here, the, the front one is probably a lower lactation cow with younger, higher lactation cows uh, behind. Uh, the reason I can tell this is the aggressiveness in the eating. But they all eat the same way. Notice how their mouth goes down and they take mouthfuls. Just bang, bang, bang. Differ in the number they take, and then the head comes up and they chew, and then the head goes down again. Bite, bite, head comes up, and they're chewing. There's no real attempt to sort that ration. Okay, this is what should be the target eating behavior in, in, in cattle. And you can see the one here now, it's five or six bite. She's loading up, she's hungry. Okay, this one here was a very old, or an older dominant cow. She was just having a merry old time there. But she, they've lost the desire uh, uh, to sort. Notice this ration. How much material can you see that looks like it's over an inch? It, it's, it's very little. This actually is one of the videos, the Dario videos we have on our jailer site. It's a jailer mixer. And there we're putting in a round bale of um, grass hay, a five by six round bale, and it's in an 850 mixer. So, but what I want to point out is the degree of, uh, and then you know, silage, corn silage, and, and other, there's nothing special about this ration. It was just processed down. So you've got some material, you know, in that one and a half inch range, but it's very little. But there is a, uh, enough of other ingredients uh, that I'll talk about later that it was holding together. We'll contrast this as to what I, what's more the norm of we see for TMRs, and I'll say right at the front, this is another JLOR customer. I only, I only show our warts as well as the, uh, but it's for a different reason here. This, in the sorting, in this herd, this is also a, a pretty good production herd in the mid 30s uh, kilos but suffering uh, with uh, a lower production than they expected and butterfat issues uh, uh, than they expected. Um, but what I want you to watch is the behavior in terms of no, uh, their activity. These guys should be eating the same way. It's fresh feed, it just laid out. And you'll notice how they're nosing around in the feed and then licking at it and picking at it and moving it around. This is what appears that I see on like 90%. And if you go home today, take a look, and it's the proportion of cows that are doing this. And what ends up happening is you'll see when they eat, you end up with these holes dug in severe cases right down, and they'll be licking on the bottom. Because what they're doing is they're just agitating the feed. And as I say, a feed that sorts, you, all you got to do is move it. The fine particles will sift down to the bottom. Then you push the top stuff out of the way, and they lick up the bottom. And this is exactly what they're doing here, just nuzzling it around, digging their little uh, grain holes. Okay. When you have this, of course, usually what happens, now it's not necessarily uh, going to be bad. Because what first needs to be done, of course, if you have sorting, one of the best indicators is you'll have some degree of variable manure. 
animals that are sorting will tend to have a loose manure. Not necessarily bad or colored. It's not the acute acidosis that people talk about where it frothes, etc. It's just lays out thinner. Some, you get the odd animal comes out in a stream. But more importantly, you'll get those that are stacked. And those are the same animal. Because what happens is they will sort for a day or two. They get a, a mild digestive upset. Then they switch and they sort for long fiber. When that comes out, you get the same animal produces a stiff manure. Then they feel good and they go back to sorting. And then you get the loose manure. And if you follow these animals, you will see that their manure is changing. And this is where the inefficiency comes in. And then sometimes when it's really bad, there's so little grain that it's your high producing cows that actually have stiff manure relative to the low producing cows a certain proportion of the low producing cows that have loose manure. It's all a matter of, of monitoring eating behavior and understanding what the cows are doing. And it's all there for you to see. Or you ask somebody to come in and take a look. Sometimes it's your neighbor or, or you know, this is why Mike Hutchins and other people who come in sometimes see things you don't because what you're looking at sometimes it, to you, it has come to appear normal when it is really just the norm. Okay, be nice. Now, so what, what should a, you know, what do ideal rations look like? These are two herds uh, I saw one day in the United States, both 40 kilo plus herds, what I was uh, quite interested in in these, they had a different composition. They were both using wet byproducts, though. But when, it, when you look at the bunk again, what was interesting is that the ration in both of these, uh, with their wet byproducts, dry matter content of these rations was in, uh, between 40 and 45 percent. Okay, and th th we have this idea that it's a dog, again a dogma that's wrong. This becomes back to silage and other things that uh, dairy rations should be 50 percent dry matter. It doesn't matter what the moisture content is inside the particles in terms of sorting. It's what's on the surface for the particles to hold together. You want moisture on the outside to hold the small particles against the big particles so they can't filter out. Even wet forages, if they're really wet inside, can be dry on the outside, and the interaction of the particles are such that the stuff can filter out. So you add enough moisture, as long as it's clean, current research and even previous research has shown you can take hay, and you can add moisture to hay down to 30% dry matter, and the intake will either not change or will increase. Okay, so when you have research like that, saying that a TMR shouldn't go below 50% dry matter is just basically wrong. And then when you take TMRs and you add clean water to them and you take them below 50% dry matter and intake increases, it further shows, because you prevent sorting, that that idea is wrong. It came out of some other areas where good silage, good quality corn silage, good quality haylage, when you put it together with grain at 50 per 50% grain, you ended up around 50% dry matter. It was concluded that this, then therefore the, the ration should be 50% dry matter. But it's all by chance. You know, it's all, that's what you'll get if all of those things come together. But there's many, many other combinations that it comes out at 65% dry matter and you lower it with water and you overcome the sorting effects. And the problem with the ration I just showed you, <laughs> uh, actually, it wasn't particle size. Particle size was fine in the sorting video. It was dry. We just added sufficient water to it to the point where the animals couldn't sort it and everything corrected and it, both production and butter fat went up. So here, uh, these two rations, two examples, I say high production herds, um, 30,000 pound uh, rolling averages and that's a U.S. quarter just to show what the particle size is. And here's another thing we'll talk, we'll talk about, the idea that that top sieve, you have people shaking and the long particles are what are important in terms of chewing. Again, another error you could say or misinterpretation 
that is, is finally working its way through the research side is that it's not that size that's important for chewing, is that effective fiber is basically anything that won't pass out of the rumen is about a half inch. So for any of you that do that type of sieving or you talk to your nutritionist, it's the sum of the two sieves, the first and the second, has to be adequate to get adequate chewing and rumination, okay? The top one is a concern and a danger in that it too much, too long on the top sieve or of the long particles over one inch is what will allow the animal to sort more, okay? And that's why adding chopped straw, chopped hay long often works against you. Adding moisture, interesting enough, even if that's as short as you can get it, adding moisture helps it get softer and tangle and hold together so it can be uh, overcome some of these problems. But you can see in this ration, there was virtually nothing an inch long. And we're talking, for, we're talking over 4% butterfats, 4.3, completely normal butterfats and high intake. So all I'm trying to do is, is, in terms of goals, is just shake a couple of these ideas and say, it, it's really the nature of the rash and holding it together so the animal eats everything uh, in one bite and cannot uh, separate things, that is the key. And we have a couple tools. Decreasing the long size down to this minimum of a half inch. Don't go any further than you have to. And making sure there's moisture in that ration to hold together. It, you know, and it really comes down to that. We have lots of sources of variability. Uh, Non-uniformity in the ration. Um, oops. We talk about within batch. There's, you know, within a given batch that we make, we have the mixer has a huge effect, the characteristics of that mixer, and to a certain extent, what the operator does, you know, in terms of when they make that batch, how long they mix it for, is it enough for, you know, what sequence they put the ingredients in, do they spend enough time making that mix? And so th those two work together within batch. Between batches, it's, it's a whole bunch of other things. You want it's consistency, um, throughout or, or over days, weeks, etc. There, we're talking more ingredient variability, battering errors, and operator ability and consistency. This is where tracking software and, and that so that you don't see, you can actually measure the variability and know what the intake is. There's two separate things. But even but from day to day, I want to focus in on the actual TMR mixer and the making of the mix, because if you control this one and make sure that this is uniform, and in terms of also adding your ingredients consistently, this takes care of itself. Uh, often problems associated with this one get blamed for being part of this one when it's more of your fundamental system that needs to be addressed. Now, first thing is, okay, you can't manage anything if you don't measure it. And of course, the Penn State particle size separator, I uh, imagine, how many people here, you know, dairy farmers, either are doing this themselves or know their nutritionist is doing this? Everybody be brave, I wanna see the hands, okay? Now, your dairy farmer, if you're a dairy farmer, you're doing this, and they're not doing this. May I see your hands? Okay. The, the greater proportion is you should talk to your nutritionist because this is probably one of the best tools on the market. We, it's so important that JLOR uh, gives, or we have our own version that we give a whole set in each of our mixers. But regardless if you have your own, your nutritionist does it, or you do it yourself. It's a simple uh, three-stack sieve, I'll show you, but when we lay out a sample, we take at least, uh, when we're testing the mixer and making sure it's right, uh, I'll say, first of all, there's a testing for most nutritionists 
they have uh, parameters of where they would like to see the distribution between the top sieve, which basically traps particles one and a half inches and longer, the middle sieve that uh, sort of traps anything a half an inch and larger, you know, anything that should stay in the rumen, I'm pretty sure, uh, such that the top two, you know, that's available for chewing. And then uh, the top one, again, as I said before, we want to minimize the risk of sorting. And the bottom one is all the fines. This is where all the grain and everything else goes. Um, now, in a mixer, we want to make sure everything's uniform. You feed out along a bunk and take a sample, at least five samples generally. For monitoring purposes, we can, we can take maybe three, one at the end, one at the middle, one uh, or one of the start, middle, and end. We only take a small sample over a short distance, and all we're trying to do is see if the, the distribution changes. But especially, we want to see um, if the amount, the ratio, the bottom to this middle one changes sufficiently or in any trend such that we think we've got a bias in our mix. And leave it to the nutritionist to uh, give their goal, uh, you know, achieve their actual goals because in this way we we can control whether or not we have both sufficient fiber for chewing but also control risk for sorting. Now I've worked out a system as a rumen function specialist that I know with Penn State system which I've worked with since its inception uh, about 1996 when I hit these situations uh, in a TMR ration, uh, there's basically no, you know, no problem with chewing, butterfat, etc. There are other situations like when you have predominantly baleage when it's hard to hit the top sieve uh, goal. But for your standard hay, haylage, corn silage type rations, the basic goal is that the top we have something, but not over 10%. So I, I put it you know, plus or minus 5%. I just want to see something there. That may, and then in the bottom, I want to see less than 50%, ideally about 45%, understanding that that's the grains and the fine forages. By difference, it means my middle is going to be 45, 50%. The reason is I want to have at least 50%, 50, 55% of the as-fed ration, you know, the forages tend to be a little wetter than the grains, above this, it's a 5 16th inch, uh, 8 millimeter, 5 16th inch sieve, just so you know, you got a hole this big, or you got a hole like this, a particle that's like a, a forage, it, it, when it passes halfway, it over tilts and f falls through. So you can have a particle that's twice the length of a hole, it'll fall through. That's why if you have an eight millimeter hole, it will retain particles that are longer than about one and a half, 1.6 millimeters. That's where the half inch is. They're great, they're actually closer to five eighths. So they're more than adequate for chewing. So I want to see the total here above 50% and no more than 50% on the bottom. The bigger this is, without increasing the amount on the top, the better things are because they'll tangle together and it'll hold together. But again, we still need the moisture. Baleage is a different story. Baleage is usually really wet. When you get baleage, it's more likely we have 20% here. But you will only get about 30% here and you get huge numbers in here because it's so wet and tangly, it's not a concern. Because if this number goes down low enough, they can't sort the stuff out. So there are variations. This system does not work in Europe where they use baleage and grass silage for that very reason. It's a North American-based system based on corn silage and, and, and hay. So for the sake of time, um, just skip over uh, one or two here. Uh, oops. Make a couple comments of other things. Those, those are the key, key parts. 
pro, you know, if you're processing hay, or even not, in terms of you get some long stuff, knives, 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 they gotta be sharp. And the way to tell, it's not just whether or not you can see stuff on the edge, this is a sharp knife. And what happens, depending on stones and, and, and rocks and that, as soon as this leading edge, it's, it is stones and sand that wears, just gets a little, little worn, so that you can take your hand and rub it on there without any concern of getting cut. When these are sharp and you have forage rubbing underneath and keening this edge, you rub your hand on there, it's like a razor blade, okay? When you get a lot of rock damage out here on the cutting surface and you can take your hand on there, those knives, uh, if it's not going to cut you, it's not going to cut forage. It's easier to cut you than it is to cut hay. It's time to rotate those knives. You can rotate these uh, up to the upper side and get a, the sharp set down on the bottom. Um, ingredient sequencing. Uh, in vertical mixers, um, it's very important that the heavy stuff go on last. Opposite of... Um, auger mixers, uh, horizontal mixers. Uh, vertical mixers work by density. Hays go in first, dry forages first, then the silages, then the grains. And with, with a vertical mixer, there's no need to have it running uh, while you're loading except to make room. Then when you start it up, that auger picks up the light material and it goes through the heavy material and then it premixes as it comes down. If you don't do that, then, oops, this is some data uh, where they weren't doing that and samples along the feed bunk. Because the grain is dense, more denser, and if you don't have enough moisture in there, it sits at the bottom. So in the first sample, there was 67% of the material on the bottom pan. Then you go down the feed bunk, there was 59%, 48%, 44%, while the months in the middle sieve and the top sieve, essentially forage, increased. This is, a, this is the type of thing that happens if it's upside down, because the denser material just circulates underneath the lighter material. Uh, you can do it, you just have to mix longer to get it to work if you are, or just have to do it that way because of the way your ingredients uh, come into the mixer. And that's all we did to fix this because of where they had their, their ingredients. But this is, this is how easy it is to sort out what, what's uh, going on with your herd or with your mixer. And, and the thing was, remember that slide of the cows along the feed bunk? This is the case of where the, the first half of the cows in the feed bunk were getting a ration that was um, you know, less than or greater than six, uh, 40 uh, in the range of 60% uh, grain on a proportional basis. Um, moisture, of course, as I said, anything dry, it'll separate. I, I'll end with this one. Um, and it's not that hard to do, um, but the resistance to sorting, uh, and the most important thing we really have to talk about, requires surface moisture, that each particle tends to stick to each other and these especially small particles to large forage particles. How you add the liquid's important too. But the thing is, even this can be detected by the shaker box because what happens, it's an as-fed system. You use that shaker box, and when this happens, you get a wetter ration when you shake it out. You will get, if you have adequate moisture, you will see that the amount on the bottom tray decreases while the middle tray increases. Because the more, even if you shake it, it won't let go. Well, if you think about it, this is exactly what you want for the cow. The more the cow works at it, she cannot separate it so it falls down. So you know, the shaker box can actually detect whether there's sufficient moisture to actually improve the situation when you have too much material that's actually able to uh, sort through. And it's not a hard thing to do. Um, this is just the key, we have wet weather, or wet weather, we have wet weather, we have cold weather like this. A couple examples, it just the, the water is uh, indoors, As someone put a tank in here, it, it has a, a, a valve, like a toilet valve in it, 
it runs and fills. They would drive their mixer in for the final mixing phase, just hit the valve, and on the T-line, which is recommended, it would dis uh, distribute across the mixer while it did the final uh, mixing phase. When that mix is done, it just starts refilling on its own. It's an automated system. In uh, uh, where I am in Winnipeg these days, this was, uh, this was a farm. They, they were already at 40 kilos, but I noticed that they were having sorting, sorting issues in one of our largest mixers. You can see that in the back here. This is a 1,300 cubic foot mixer. So I explained this to him. This is his distribution pipe. There's holes down here as well as the ends open, so he gets distribution all along the one side while it's mixing. And what he did is um, put his tank inside in the, in the, in the milk room. Uh, there's a pump here. This fills from his water system. Uh, he's got other attachments where he can do other things. There's a, there's a valve here, so um, he just fires this up, fills his water, gets excellent distribution and fast filling, and then um, uh, just uh, closes this off and he has a valve here he can open to make sure that uh, there's no water left on the outside. In his case, he can leave water in that line. If you had a short line, you have a valve, a discharge valve at the bottom this is to let it in, but a valve here you can just, uh, or, or here would be better, just let the water drop in here and drain and so it won't freeze in the line. So it's a very, very easy thing to set up uh, and the impact it has is huge. Um, for him, in one week it increased his milk production 5% and increased his butter fat by 0.2%. Uh, so it's that easy. Uh, water addition, last slide. I know I've, I'm going, I don't even know what my real time was, but uh, anyhow, this is the key. Often people underestimate what's required. So add the water after all ingredients have been added during the final mixing phase. You want, the key is, it's got to go on the surface. You don't want to soak the particles. You want it on the surface so, you know, some particles get wet and they stick to the other particles. And then for lactating dairy cows, what I recommend, you track how much you mix, okay? Then the water goes on after. You don't, even, you don't program it because you're not programming to a moisture content in your ration. So you mix first and then you add the water. Well, you, well, you get all the ingredients in that. In the, in the mix? Yeah, you weigh, you weigh all your ingredients, you know, so that they're all in the mixer. The water's the last thing that goes on. Well, it's, no, you want, you want the mixer turning when you add water so that the idea is that you're, uh, and, and, and mixing fast, so that the water touches as many particles directly as possible. So is that uh, clear? Not, you don't want it stationary and add a bunch of water because once you wet a certain spot, and you don't want a hose just going in, because once you wet a clump of feed, the moisture doesn't go anywhere then all you're doing is trying to mix and push that clump of feed around to get a distribution of wet feed. Think of the same as try throwing in a shot of wet silage. It stays wet silage. It doesn't wet the other feed. So you're, it, it's sort of, you've got a mix going round and round, and you've got a spray of water going on there, so you're trying to wet as many, as much of the ingredients as you can, and you run that water in, you time it, Ideally, so you do the whole final f uh, mixing phase, you have water going in. That way you wet everything. But this is a key. I start by adding five kilos or 10 pounds per head per day and leave it for about four days, okay? This is if you're starting from scratch. And then you, you see if you have a response. You look at the manure, you look at the way the cattle eat. If after four days, it, you know, usually you'll see a response, if nothing else, in more uniform you know, intake can go up, it can go down, anything can happen. More often than not, you see a benefit in a uniformity of manure and just more general intake. Then um, add another 
two and a half kilos, five pounds per cow. It can be two kilos, it doesn't matter. And then watch for another four days. You keep doing that until the last ad, you might do it for a month, until the last ad doesn't seem to have any benefit. And then you drop it back one. And that's the level, because as long as you see an improvement in butter fat, in intake, or manure, it's having a beneficial effect. I've never seen a negative effect from adding water to feed, as long as it was clean drinking water. Um, and uh, the same goes, the half rate, uh, it would be used for dry cows, and even you, the same thing applies for dry cows and for growing heifers. And with that, I'll draw her to a close. If <laughs> you can allow one question, and I'll, I'm around for the rest of the day, so we can have lots more. Right here. Oh, I'll make the answer short, so we maybe speak in two questions. Otherwise, I'll make it a long answer. So you've, you say you've never seen a detrimental uh, from adding water. It's like, see in the summertime when it gets really hot and stinky. How do you address that at that okay. point? Good question. Actually, I, I meant with this method. Uh, good question. That summer, yes, you have to watch the level in that uh, if you adding water can cause heating. So in the summer, you add, and if you start to feel that the, the feed is heating, but my recommendation in the summer, you've got to feed twice a day. Hey, yeah, just once a day, you're just asking for heating and lower intake. Um, uh, right now, uh, we're dealing with a lot of snow and ice and bunk systems. Yeah. Do you have any uh, things that would, in, like, would this method intervene with that? Sometimes we get uh, feed that's a little, when snow, it's a little lighter, yeah. and with uh, when it's ice, it's a little heavier. Yeah. So You'll be surprised that your normal ration is 50% dry matter. You'll be surprised that it sounds like you're adding a lot. This is why you do the incremental, and you'll be surprised that at this level, you can take the feed and squeeze as hard as you want, and you won't get any moisture out of it. If you can take your feed and squeeze it and get any moisture coming out of it, it's too much water. You're down to 30%. 35% dry matter, so you, you, it's not an issue because it, it starts to absorb into the feed as well. But just go as far as uh, and see how it goes. Uh, like the first increments, 10, 20 pounds, you're not going to have it. If you've got a problem of sorting because of dry feed, you're not going to have any problem you know, for the first 20 pounds or, of water per cow. Or if you do, uh, my, my email address is... Uh, readily available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.